So I'm Claire Hughes Johnson. I'm very excited to be here with many of you and mine, old and dear friend and former Googler, Sarah Wampler, but we will not be calling her that. <laughs> <laughs> she, this is Sarah Ramsey today. <laughs> For purposes of video posterity, we are being recorded. Just want everyone to know. Um, so Sarah, I think we all know, know, grew up in Iowa and still returns often to Iowa to play board games <laughs> with her family, uh, because that's what you do, I guess, besides the corn <laughs> in Iowa. Is that fair? That's fair. All right. And went to Stanford and stayed out here and took a temporary job <laughs> with Google and then stayed with us for a long time. Tried to take a leave to work on her writing. We just reeled her back in. But she's now out, award-winning author of um, is romance novel the category, or is this like a subcategory? Romance novel is pretty appropriate. You think it's okay? Yeah, historical romance. Historical romance. <laughs> Still a romance. Is Georgette Higher part of the category, or is she not? She's the mother of the category, so I'm impressed that you knew who she I, was. I read a lot of her novels when yeah. I was back visiting my family, and it was boring. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much how I got into it. <laughs> okay, so this is exciting. So are we? I noticed we don't have any plans for you to read an excerpt. <laughs> I think that's probably for the best. <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, there are 50 but books over here. we do have some, some copies for folks. I'm, I'm thrilled. So your novel, Harris Without a Cause? Yes. Uh, has won a couple of pieces of acclaim. Can you describe the industry and what those awards are? for people who are maybe not aware. Yeah, so for those of you who aren't aware, the romance industry has this, it's this entire subculture that I think none of us have ever laid eyes on until I started going into it and realized just how many people there are and how many magazines there are and the awards and everything like that. So this novel, when it was still unpublished, finaled for the Romance Writers of America Golden Heart Award, which is given to the best unpublished romances and it gets about 1,200 entries. They give it at this conference that draws 2,000 people. There's about 10,000 people in this organization. Um, so that was exciting. And then when it came out, it got four stars from Romantic Times, which is the industry magazine. So I have the magazine at home, and it has the little like blurb and all the covers, and it's pretty scandalous. So it was exciting. OK, so you sent this entry in at one out of 1,200 entries, yeah. which is amazing. Then you self-published. Right. So talk about that decision and how it works in the industry. Yeah, so I had, I think as a lot of you who knew me knew, I wrote two books and was in that process when I finally left Google. Um, the first book won that award and the second book finaled for that award. Um, and I got an agent and you know we were sort of moving along that path of, oh, I'm going to get a traditional deal and this is going to be great. Um, but neither of those books ended up selling and the market has been so tough with... Ever selling since the to economy, a publisher. Yeah, ever since the economy collapsed, um, all of the big publishers are part of these bigger media conglomerates, you know, so they're part of like News Corp or Viacom or something like that. And they just can't take the risk on a smaller author because they're looking at their bottom line so stringently. So my agent, with the first book, we were like, I'll just shove it under the bed. I'll write another one because there weren't options at that time. This was in 2008, 2009. Um, but now with Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and I'll give a shout out to Google eBooks, although it doesn't quite deserve the same level of acclaim, unfortunately. All five of them that sold. Yes, yes. <laughs> to people in this room. <laughs> Probably. Um, all of those options have come up for authors, and it's a really exciting time because, you know, two years ago I couldn't go down this road, but when I was looking at the numbers, I think Claire knows I like brightly colored spreadsheets that have, you know, a lot of numbers all over the place and aren't necessarily organized according to business school plans, but they do work and they told me that it would be fairly straightforward for me to sell enough copies to make as much as I would have been on an, on an advance from a traditional publisher. You know, in these days, a tr publisher may give $4,000 for the first book. Yeah, you don't get a lot for your first book, right? Right. So yeah. you're feeling like you're on, with, with the sales of this self-published, you're on track. Yeah, once you all buy a copy today. No. <laughs> yeah, it feels pretty good. I mean, yeah. I think that it was the right decision for me. And I think, too, coming from someplace like Google, where we're so used to things moving fast. You know, if I took six months to get back to Claire on an email, which I <laughs> never did, I hope. No. No. I would have been fired, right? Whereas in publishing, it's traditional that my agent sent the manuscript out to these publishers last April. And by October, we still hadn't heard back from three of them. And when she would call, she'd say, oh, we're still considering it. But finally, I was like, we're going to pull this, and I'm going to do it myself. because. 
the speed with which the industry is changing, I couldn't keep sitting there for a year waiting for them to make a decision. So. All right, so what everyone is dying to know is how did your Google experience <laughs> prepare you? <laughs> so you talked about launch, getting a, a speedy launch. Anything else? Is anyone here in the book? <laughs> I like how you snuck that in at the bottom of that question. I was prepared to go a career route. I'll answer the, is anyone here in the book first? No. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, come on. Are they, the character? Alan Moss. Uh, Alan Moss is not in the book. Lo loosely I based on? Um, I will say, you know, I'll have little interactions with people, and I don't even necessarily remember who the person was, but they'll end up, you know, in the book in a different context. You know, if I see someone, I don't know, walk funny or do something a little bizarre, all of those things sort of end up in the creative process, but it's not like you could pick out and say that character is Alan Moss, for example, <laughs> right? Like, he's not in the book, I promise. But, and there was one funny moment where I realized that I'd put somebody's last name in as a placeholder for a servant and then forgot to take it out because I was just like trying to think of a name and then I forgot to take it out. So if like that person ever reads this book. Like a last name that is an unusual last name? Um, it's actually not someone in this room. Um, it was somebody from one of my dorms at Stanford. So that should encourage that corner of this room to read the book. He's a servant. All right, interesting. So back to the Google experience yeah. novelist. Yeah, you know, I think that, as Claire said, I started here as a temp, and I intended to stay for about six months and was going to go off and get a PhD in English, which I quickly realized was not going to pay any bills at all. Um, and I really liked Google, and I think that the longer I stayed, you know, I, there were always those days where I felt like I should be writing a book or, you know, pursuing this passion, but I will say I don't think I could have been nearly as successful self-publishing if I hadn't had the business and marketing experience that I got here. Um, you know, being able to do something like put together a spreadsheet and say this is how much I would have made this way versus that way, or, you know, working for Clara with the communications job, I wrote the back cover copy for my book, which is a very different skill than writing a novel, right? Writing fiction is very different than saying, these are the five words that are going to appeal to somebody and this is how I get my message across. So I think from that perspective, you know, even though the job wasn't related to what I wanted to do with my writing, all of those little career things have really helped. And I think it's easy to lose sight of that when you're thinking, when you're sitting in a job thinking, this isn't what I want to do. It's easy to forget that you're still learning things that could help you later with that path. And then I recall some conversations that, you know, it is very lonely to be home without your Diet Coke soda machine. It's very, very difficult. Um, the Diet Coke, not the how do you, How did you figure out, how did you end up sticking with it? Because there were some moments where maybe you, yeah. you weren't so excited to stick with it. I'll be open. There was a moment last spring where I emailed Claire and I was like, can I have my job back? <laughs> I wasn't going to say it. But yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. it, I mean, it was sort of set up for me to admit that. Um, yeah. I would say that it was hard, and I think the first six months is the hardest, and that's why, you know, when I took my first leave of absence, it was six months, and I came back, because it's not enough time to really break yourself out of all the habits that you have in a job that I was really, not just comfortable in, but really happy with, right? Like, I didn't leave Google because I was unhappy, and so my first leave, I will admit, going back to Iowa was maybe not the wisest choice either, because board games are great, but you can only play so many of them <laughs> before you start thinking, maybe I need something more. Um, but my, I think taking more than six months to actually get on my feet and move into the city helped. So I moved to San Francisco. I was living in this log cabin out in the woods of Palo Alto. If you can believe they exist, I found the one log cabin in Palo Alto. Um, I think getting more active with my social life and accepting like I have to get out of the house and yeah. take more time. I think you know this too. Most of the people that I've worked with here are so driven and goal-oriented, that if you're doing your own thing, it's easy to just spend all your time doing that. You know, starting to feel guilty, like if I'm not making progress on this, I'm a bad person and I'm wasting my time and, you know, the world's going to explode, which as it turns out is not true. Um, but that's still a work in progress for me to figure out how do I have a balanced social life and still get things done and feel good about, you know, everything that I'm doing. So how does that work? Do you have certain hours that you're writing? You probably know that I'm not the most organized. It's like, how do you procrastinate when... How do I procrastinate? Um, I procrastinate pretty well. I would say if you want to follow me on Twitter, I tweet often about the Sarah Apocalypse. 
which involves a lot of glitter, and my branding is a little weird. I'm still figuring out my brand. Um, I would say I don't really have set times, but I try to set number of words per week that I want to hit, which I find works better for me. You know, I read all these things, like all these famous authors get up at five and they write until eight, and then they have coffee, and then they read a book, and then they write from three to five. I could never, I couldn't get up at five for one thing. Getting down here was hard enough, but. For a noon. <laughs> hey, the time changed yesterday. This is really 11. This is really 11. And I had to blow dry my hair. Um, yeah, I'm just not that kind of I writer. I skipped that this morning due to the time change. Yeah, yeah. I can relate to that. So you mentioned you just finished your second. So this is book one of the right. Muses of Mayfair. Yes. And you just finished book two, Draft. Last night. Last night. The whole thing. So how long, how long did it take to write that? That's what we're trying to get at here. We're talking. I'm looking at my roommate who has seen me not leave my room for days. Um, that's my roommate. Um, the interesting thing was that this second book was actually the first book that I wrote in 2009. And so I wrote that book and it didn't sell and I put it away. Gretchen read it. Um, it didn't sell. And Alan Moss was in it, right? No. <laughs> Again, Alan Moss up, we was not this. in any books. <laughs> I'm saving it until I get really famous, and then I'll write a book just about him. But I want to have the audience built in so I can take advantage. That's fair. That's a good plan. So you rewrote the book. I rewrote. So what I initially Scotsman did was... Scotsman Prefer Blondes. Is Scotsman the working Prefer title. Blondes. Yes, it's not just the working title. It, the it will be the title. Yeah. I, don't I guess if you self-publish, you can just make the, yeah. the titles. Which is nice. Um... Yeah, so I rewrote the book, and it was a very painful process because when I originally intended to self-publish, I said, oh, this is great. I have two books that are done. I can get them out back to back. I started advertising. They were coming out back to back. And then I read it, and I was like, oh, crap, because my writing style has changed a lot. I've learned a lot as a writer. I've gotten a lot. I think I've gotten better. We'll see. Um, there were things that... I legitimately saw that I could have done better in the first book. And because I had put it away and wrote the second book to be the prequel, there were continuity issues. Mm. So I initially thought it'll take me three weeks to fix this. My roommate's still laughing because that was in October. And <laughs> I think looking through it, I probably kept maybe five to eight percent of the first. Wow, version. just that? I wrote the entire thing. Since Don't October. Do that. So you basically. If there are any writers in the room, just throw it away and like do something else because it was really, really painful. But that's less than six months. I mean, that's you rewrote yeah. basically a whole book. It's true. But it On was... the bright side. <laughs> it's hard to see the bright side because I haven't slept. But yeah. no, it is good. I think it was a good process to go through. I think I'm just worried that this is my process because I go through these... I've written two books, but word-wise, I've really written four. And so I need to figure out, you know, is this my process? And I'm just the kind of person who writes a book and then looks at it and rewrites it? Or can I figure out how to do it without that pain? Well, except for if you look at, I think my battery, oh no, I'm okay. If you look at, I don't know, Jonathan Franzen or Jeffrey Eugenides, it takes them like nine or 10 years between books. Yeah. So if you can write two books in a matter of a month, yeah. that may be a fair process. That I feel like this maybe needs to be a therapy session. Yeah. You guys could just like, just like listen I just for a while like, while we. I don't think that's I a bad had a thing. I've one-on-one with you in a long so, time. So, <laughs> back back to the. So let's talk about. Well, first of all, you talked about your writing style has changed. Why? What what happened? Did, was it getting away from writing emails at Google? <laughs> uh, Claire's blog actually really helped me to find my writing style. No, um, actually, I think some of that's true. Like, I think. And I know I shouldn't just keep pointing at people in the audience for the sake of YouTube, but uh, Heather, who managed me several years ago, would get all over me because my emails were like this long. And they always made sense and they were well written, but they were novels, they weren't you know, sort of bullet point things. And I think my writing style as I've seen it has changed from, you know, that first book I wrote sort of in fits and starts from 2005 to 2008. Now, I think my writing is a lot crisper, and the sentences tend to be shorter. I'm a little more focused on pacing than I was. Like, yep. they're not these long, flowery, I'm in love with the language. Now it's more, hopefully, I'm trying to get more of the character across, and I'm not just using pretty words that are big. And well, are these good. more character-driven or plot-driven, when you think about 
I'd say they're more character driven. And that was the big problem with the first book was that it was so character driven that the feedback from the publishers who didn't decide to buy it was that there wasn't enough going on. Like they were really fun characters and they loved watching them sort of banter with each other because I do like to banter, but nothing really happened. Like they got married, great. Like, and that happens in a romance, but there needs to be a little more. If they don't have any conflict, why didn't they just get married day one and maybe banter at the wedding and then the book's over? So I needed a little more plot. So crisper writing, a little more plot, a little more action. Yeah. Um, let's talk about this particular genre. Is this, how did you decide this is it for you? Um, I kind of or fell into it. it. I don't know if it's it, you know, and I think everyone who's worked with me knows I tend to get bored with stuff at some point, so I don't think that I'll write romance for the rest of my life. I'll probably keep coming back to it, though. And I think the nice thing about romance is that it's such a huge genre that I can choose to do other things within it. You know, I'm working on these historical romances, but I've got this young adult project on the side that's not historical at all um, that does have romantic elements. And I think that it's a great place to Are you going to write of, that under the same name or new name? I haven't decided yet. I mean, the sad thing is I've sort of been... Sarah Ramsey sounds much more romantic, which is why I went with it. Sarah Wampler, less romantic, all the way at the end of the alphabet. Back when bookstores mattered, I was thinking I didn't want to be the person on the last shelf. I wanted to be closer to like Nora Roberts or Julia Quinn, who are big romance authors. Now it doesn't matter as much because people aren't walking into bookstores and finding those books. But we'll see. Um, yeah, so I don't know what name I'll write under, and I don't know that I'll write romance forever, but I think it's a good... It's a great place to build an audience. Romance readers read a lot of books. So the average romance reader probably reads, I don't know, four to 10 a month, um, which is huge. Up with that. <laughs> they like their romance. And they tend to, but they also tend to read outside the genre too. You know, they don't necessarily just read romance. They'll also read mystery or fantasy or sci-fi. Do they or, write to you? Do you have fans? I mean, what's up? Are they? I've gotten a couple of fan letters, which was really crazy. Um, yeah. It's very odd. If you write Dear Sarah at sarahramsey.com, I will respond to you. Um, yeah, it's odd. And people, you know, I see things starting to pop up on blogs where they read the book and they're giving a review. Goodreads is a really popular reader site where people are starting to review the book. So it's been, it was pretty exciting the day that I finally got an email that wasn't like my mom or somebody sitting in this room <laughs> saying that they'd read the book and they really liked it. So, what do they give you any feedback or is it just. I didn't... Good one. <laughs> the, people, the people who emailed so far, I know people who have gotten emails that, you know, just rip them apart for being too steamy or too something or getting their facts wrong or whatever. And there was one Barnes & Noble review. You're not supposed to read the reviews as an author. You're supposed to pretend that you're impervious and that none of it affects yeah, you. Right. But I read every single one and I have a Google <laughs> alert set up and I like, don't wait for the Google alert. I like search on Google every day and just look <laughs> through all the pages. Because um, Google Alert's like four to ten hours behind, probably, which is not <laughs> fast enough. So we know how you're spending your morning. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the procrastination question. That's what I do. Um, so yeah, you, but there so was you a, got one review that said... There was, there was one review on Barnes & Noble that they did not like that a Duke was treated with disrespect. <laughs> Which I found really interesting. Were they British? I mean, what's up? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't think so. But they said they'd read another book. They really liked it. But they didn't like the Duke being disrespected. So if any of you care about Dukes, don't buy the book. I'm not your target author. So what about this, this quote that's now made its way into your bio? True story. I had to turn the little overhead fa air fan on <laughs> while reading on the airplane. I was so flushed from reading the love scenes. <laughs> another Barnes & Noble review. Um, it was like the first one I got that wasn't somebody I knew. And I was like, oh, awkward. Because my mom called. I was like, hey, did you see the review on Barnes & Noble? I was like, yes, I did. She did get flushed from reading the love scenes. Uh, turned on the little overhead fan. I don't know. People, I can't control reviews. Are they that steamy? I mean, I'm going to take my copy. <laughs> <laughs> Gretchen, Gretchen's like, yes. They're steamy, but I would say they don't dominate the book. Like, that's how I would put it. You know, there's, and this is, this is what romance at its, I'm not going to say I'm romance at its best, but romance when it's at its best is, you know, there is a full story arc that goes through it and the characters are the focus, but there are a few scenes where, you know, the sex is part of their relationship and that their character development and their emotional arc shows through that too. You know, so where someone like George at Hire, first of all, 
they usually didn't admit that they loved each other until like the last two pages. And then when they did, they might kiss once and then it's over, <laughs> which is good. And there's something to be said for that, but I think romance, at least modern romances, tend to show a couple's entire relationship and doesn't just close the door when it's time for them to go off and make babies. So, <laughs> or not make babies. So, whatever. So the genre is evolving <laughs> from when I read a couple of books, clearly. Um, and what about this Fifty Shades of Grey thing going on? Can we talk about this? Fifty Shades of Grey. So how many of you have heard of Fifty Shades of Grey? Yeah. Wow. You need to hang with some uh, moms in the suburbs, yeah. which I Yeah. It is do. a suburban mom phenomenon from what I've heard. Um, so Fifty Shades of Grey is a trilogy that originally started as Twilight fan fiction. Um, so this woman wrote this story of Bella and Edward. Hate Bella. Don't tell anybody. She's I think like you just told some people. I did. She's useless. Anyway, I'm not. So I may not be the she target audience. She seemed like a vehicle for other people. She was. Yeah, she had no real desires of her own. Anyway, I'm not going off on that. So she wrote this fan fiction, but it had sort of a um, BDSM element, which those of you who worked in Edward's <laughs> approval bin know what that is. Um, <laughs> So, bondage, domination, sadism, and masochism, or domination and submission, the DNS mean two different things. So, they have this, Fifty Shades of Grey has Bella, who is now named something else, I don't know, obviously is a I fairly, like, vapid and useless girl, but she ends up attracted to this guy who's an extreme sexual dominant, rather than being a vampire. So, they're not vampires anymore. He's now a like, dominant Yeah, I don't get man. how it's Twilight. I, first of all, I haven't read it, but as it was described to me by people who have, it, it didn't, the Twilight fan fiction thing got lost in translation. It's just this yeah. particular author got inspired by that. This yeah. is a British author. Yeah. And then wrote these, this book that's sort of erotic. Yeah, so it's basically erotica. It's not really a romance. <laughs> drama? I don't know. Which I don't think Twilight was really a romance. Like, Twilight was definitely a young adult, and it had romantic elements, but it's not, like... If you're thinking Twilight is a romance novel, then you should read a romance novel. Or read Twilight, <laughs> but I wouldn't recommend that. Um, but, but what I was getting at is, it seems like that is being treated in a separate category. I don't know if it's yeah. because it's such a phenom, but it's also being treated differently because it has so many more digital downloads than people buying any physical copies, which yeah. would make sense if you it's understand the, the content of the book. Yeah. Uh, so what does it make you, I mean, I'm kind of getting at this from a business perspective. I think the thing is moving because yeah. of this particular book. Well, I think, and I think that's something that I was considering when I was writing my books is that the online space, especially romance readers went online really fast because if you're reading 10 books a month, having a Kindle makes sense, right? Like they're cheaper. You don't have hundreds of them stacked in your house. Um, you're not on the airplane with the You're not on the airplane with the cover. Photo. And so erotica has actually grown tremendously as a subgenre of that because of the cover issue, right? Like if you can sit there and read Fifty Shades of Grey at your coffee shop and people think you're reading like Dickens, great, right? <laughs> you're in Menlo Park, you're sitting in a Cafe Barone, you're, you know, yeah. secretly reading erotica, which is good. Um, Getting out the personal fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should get personalized misters that you can have. That'd be a good giveaway. Um, yeah, so I think, but I think romance as a whole is moving steamier too because that's where publishers see the market being. You know, publishers are making the most money off erotica and so they keep, one of the rejections we got for the first book was it wasn't sexy enough. Even though this woman had to turn on her overhead fan to read a couple of the scenes, right? That's the direction they're moving. But I think the good thing too about ebooks is that there's a market for erotica, but a book that may have a little bit less of an erotic focus can still find the audience, right? There's definitely people out there, myself included, who are looking for more of the, like not sweet characters. historic, but yeah, sort of more of a historical influence rather than just sexy times. Well, let's talk about the historical. How do you know what you're talking about there in the Muses of Mayfair? Are you researching the period? Are yeah. you just so I watching read a, a lot of PBS? Of these. <laughs> I read a ton of these before I got started, so I have read for you know, romance novels since my first one was Wait, when I was Hold 12. on a second. So you're getting your historical knowledge from other romance no, novels? No, so that was the point I was going to get to, was that there's now this whole phenomenon called Romance Landia, which if you read any of these romance blogs, which I'm sure none of you do, um, it's this problem where people have read so many of these, and Georgette Heyer was the founder of this genre. They've read so much of her that, not Claire, Georgette Heyer, who, uh, they think that that's the fact, 
right? And so you read these books where everyone goes and they waltz all throughout the book, right? They do these waltzes. The waltz wasn't actually in London until 1815, and even then it was still really scandalous, and a lot of people didn't dance it until the 1820s or 1830s. But if you don't put it in the book, you run the risk of, basically you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, because the people who have read a lot of romance but haven't studied the period think that you've made a mistake if you do something that violates the sort of romance landia rules. But then if you put them waltz in, in like 1805, you'll get emails from people who are like, the waltz wasn't in London and you treated a duke with disrespect, right? So <laughs> I think that's a huge issue. It's figuring out, and a lot of times I just try to avoid some of those issues. You know, like, I but just don't do you have you know, them. you clearly researched outside side of Romance Landia. Yeah, so I'm so part Romance of... So Romance Landia has its own version of our history yeah. is what I'm taking. Okay, yeah. so you have done your own research. I have done my own research. There's an online special interest chapter of Romance Writers of America, if any of you are interested, called The Beaumont, that is just Regency historical writers. They are a wealth of information. You can send them emails and say, what kind of boots would this guy be wearing in April of this year? They know. I have costume books. I have a membership to Stanford Library, which is awesome because they have basically every historical book you would ever need to research. You know, When I was writing this first book where the heroine's an actress, I was researching what plays were being put on that year, what theaters were popular, who the actresses were, that kind of thing, which was really fun. And since I majored, since I mitered in history in college, it's kind of a chance for me to be a huge dork and read all these books and write it off on my taxes. So. <laughs> I see. I see the angle there. Don't tell the IRS either. <laughs> so that's may included not need to go up. in. Um, should not have said IRS. <laughs> so, so that's. So that is included in your writing process. Yeah. Before or after you write something, you go back and add historical details, or you research before. Um, I'd say I do some of it before. You know, figuring out if there's a main plot point, like could this woman do this at this time? I need to know before. Yeah as I've discovered before I have to rewrite the entire book. Um, but little things like what kind of coat would he wear to this event or you know, who a person might be at this party, I just make a note in my manuscript and keep going. Because if I sat down and researched everything as it came up, I would just go down rabbit holes and research for days. Wikipedia is probably, other than Twitter, the place where I spend the most of my time procrastinating. All right. So we're going to go to some questions. So start thinking of your questions. I'll anticipate one, which is maybe there's some aspiring novelists or even nonfiction writers here in the room. What, what advice would you give to folks who are wondering if they have a, a dual or second career as a writer coming from where they're sitting now? Uh, make sure when you leave that you're ready to leave so you don't come crawling back for your job, which is awkward. And then you say, actually, I don't want it back which is doubly awkward. Um, well, luckily, I, are you sure you want it back? <laughs> yeah. No. No, it was pretty obvious. Claire was very good. Um, I, think, I think this is a very safe place to explore your writing before you actually go off into the world and try to write full time. You know, there's so much freedom to do your own thing. There's obviously benefits, which are incredibly valuable, Diet Coke, all of that. But I think just... I don't know, taking that time to get through that first manuscript first, I think is really valuable. You know, I wrote that first manuscript and it won the award and that was great. But looking at it now, I realize it really wasn't ready to be published. And in my head, because I tend to do things fairly well and tend to succeed at things that I want to succeed at, not to, you know, talk myself up too much, but I'm used to that sort of level of success. It was really hard when it didn't sell. And I think going through that process, it was good that I still had this job to fall back on, because if I hadn't, not just from a money standpoint, but if I had been going through that process of trying to sell the first book, living alone in my cabin, without being able to come in to work every day and think about something else for a few hours, I probably would have just gone insane. Like, it would have been incredibly difficult emotionally to, if that was my only thing. So I think getting to the point where you feel comfortable that you're truly on that path before leaving is really important. Great. Uh, any other, any questions? More? Hi, Carrie. Okay. Hi, Sarah, congratulations. Um, I wanted to ask about um, if you did any kind of workshops or what kind of support network you had as you were getting towards your um, publishing. Yeah. yeah, so workshops, there are so many writing resources out there. It's Romance is just a sort of a sub piece of the broader shadow writing community that exists. And I think the Bay Area is fantastic for it. There are so many people here who 
want to write, and so the opportunities are pretty big. The first things I did were, Stanford has great continuing studies classes in writing. Um, none of them were romance, but it was still really helpful to you know, talk to other writers. I took a historical fiction class, which was really great. I know there are other colleges in the area that do that. I just was close to Stanford. Um, and then any genre that you're writing, with the exception of literary fiction, because I think they don't like to band together because they're you know, too snobby. I didn't say that. Um, mystery, romance, sci-fi, all of those groups have their own professional organizations, and joining that was huge. So I joined Romance Writers of America. They have a conference every year that they put on events. I'm now part of the San Francisco chapter. I go to that once a month. They bring in are, speakers. Are, are the people kind of people you'd be friends with? I mean, just... <laughs> they are. Um, this is being taped, so they are, actually. Um, <laughs> it is a really strange and different world that I was used to at Google. The first one I went to was in 2008, and I think I was probably in the like 99th percentile in terms of youth. You know, I'm still really young compared to a lot of romance novelists. I think a lot, especially in romance, it tends to be more women who have, you know, raised their kids at least up to toddler age and are now starting to do something else. Um, so the average age is probably like 48 to 50. I can't tell. But um, yeah, I mean, with any group, right? Like a lot of writers are pretty introverted, so some of the conversations can be awkward. But there are a lot of people who are, you know, I think romance novelists get stereotyped as the woman who sits alone with her cat, which is why I don't have a cat. But um, Good call. Yeah. yeah. But if you go to these conferences, a lot of the people are actually lawyers or doctors or came from someplace like Google or, you know, it's basically any broad spectrum of society that you took, you could find a romance novelist in any one of those, which is the same with readers, right? Like, I know there are secret romance novel, novel readers in this room who may not talk about it, but they're out there. If you would connect and start reading more, that would be wonderful. So did you go to any writer space? I don't know, my brother has like a, he goes to this place in New York and they all sit there and write. Um, no, I don't go to a writer space, but I found it's really helpful for me if I'm in the last, like, if I have the sort of next to last draft of the book to go away for a few days and just read it and then figure out how to edit it. So about a month ago, I went to Santa Cruz for four days and just got a like rental on the beach and read the book and made my notes and figured it out and had my little panic attack and then was good. Which Santa Cruz isn't that far away. If someone wanted to have dinner with me, I could have easily driven here, but it was just far enough to say, no, I'm in my writing space. I need these few days. Other questions? All right, great. Oh comment and a question. So um, I'm currently tracking my Scottish history, so if you need any stories, I'm happy to, to provide. I don't know how scandalous they might be. Um, so back to the self-publishing piece. Um, I'm curious if, you know, when I think about the music industry and how hard that is for some people to break into it, and they've we've had phenomenons like Justin Bieber making it through YouTube. Is there the equivalent for a writer? I know you have a blog. I follow you on Twitter. How, how do you get noted? Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. I always know what you're up to. Um, how does a writer get recognized in the, the... It is really tough. And I think because, you know, there isn't that sort of like instant gratification of a video on YouTube, right? Although I'm thinking about ways to use YouTube. My roommate works at YouTube, so I get talk in my ear about it. Um, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, but I think... You know, there are reader communities out there. So I mentioned Goodreads. There's Shelfari, which is affiliated with Amazon. There's different places where readers congregate. Um, Goodreads I have sort of a love-hate relationship with because they, some of the communities can be pretty caustic, you know, and tend to review, their reviews tend to skew more negative than necessarily you would see on like barnesandnoble.com. Um, so each place has their own sort of weird community and just getting used to that is important. But I think... I don't know, the most helpful thing for me right now has been connecting with other authors who are more established than me who then do things like retweet my tweets or, which I know sounds ridiculous, but retweet my tweets or share my book on Facebook because they already have more of an audience than I do. And so building that network, I think through other authors, I don't know, or maybe we just tell ourselves that because everyone I interact with on Twitter is either someone I know or another author. I don't know that I have more than a dozen pure readers on Twitter. But it's sort of well, our version of like 750-ish. It's got to be more than 12 readers. I don't know. And there's some spam bots too. But <laughs> I don't block them because it's really gratifying to see that my number is like 750. Um, 
But okay, Twitter's like 20, kind of 30. our version of like a water cooler, right? Like if you're sitting in your house and you're all alone, it's our version of being able to like get it together and gossip. So I don't know, Amy, there's not a really great way to become a phenomenon. I don't know how Fifty Shades took off. I, I'm baffled. We should find out. All right, we had another question. You still have? Really? It was about Twitter? Well, I have a question. <laughs> so how important it is that, um, so when you are writing the characters, the thought patterns and everything, are they real or realistic or are they more like fiction that you made it up? How, how important it is to you that um, you match real thought patterns like across humanity? Yeah, that's a good question. I think. I will fully admit that I'm sure it's hard for me to have a realistic guy's thought pattern, and I try, right? But I'm not a guy. I don't think like a guy. I may think more like a guy than I should sometimes. But you know, with romance, at least the kind that I write, it tends to alternate points of view between probably two thirds of it is in the heroine's point of view. You know, her thought pattern, her perception of what's going on. About a third of it's in the guy's point of view. I'll fully admit I probably don't get the guy right all the time. You know, I do try to. Now it's going to sound like I'm stereotyping, but like I tend to be a little more directive in the way he talks. You know, women tend to speak more with the question at the end of the voice and the, you know, making excuses for their behavior or apologizing excessively. And guys don't do that as much. So I've thought a little about what I've seen in the workplace, what I've learned from the trainings we've gone through, where we all do our different colors or our like, you know, <laughs> ENTJ or P or whatever you are. And I think about that. I don't know if the exact speech pattern is right. But do you write a backstory, like a human, like this is a real person kind of story, even though I, it's not all in the book? Do you have it in your head or do you write it? Or Yeah, I have stuff in my head that never makes it in the book. You know, like things that happened when they were kids or what they wanted to do, you know, things that happen sort of off stage that don't get referenced. But for me, you know, it makes them feel a little more three dimensional. Um, and those little details like could pop up in future books which is always fun. Because I do want to have enough of a consistent pattern for a character that I don't write myself into a corner and then discover that, you know, last book I said that he was an orphan and now I really need him to have a mom. Like, I need to have an idea of who he is. And then if, I, if that person is solid enough, I would never think he needs to have a mom because within me, he's never had one. I don't know if that makes sense. It's kind of, I don't know. No, I get it. Uh, I get it. You know. It's like the storyboard. Hi. Um, I'm a longtime writer, and I've always had a full-time career job outside of that. And so I'm curious. You talked about um, that you created a personal metric for yourself around words and, and that. And you obviously were happy here, so you felt like you needed to leave Google to be in that space and be writing. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about how it helped you, if it helped you significantly, leaving your full-time career to go to your other full-time career to write in terms of, because um, I know you can't just sit eight, nine, ten times a day and write, it doesn't, or hours a day, it doesn't work like that. So I'm curious about how did it help you, did it help you to really just be in that space and be away in terms of your productivity and meeting your goals? Yeah. It's an interesting question because a lot of the writers I've talked to, when they leave their full-time jobs, they still write just as much as they did when they had a full-time job, which is kind of awkward because you're, you know, oh, I'm still writing five pages a day, but I don't get paid anymore. Um, I wouldn't, I would say my productivity has gone up some, but the time that I would have spent in my job, I now spend marketing or networking or building my business plans, working on, you know, soliciting cover art, things like that. I wouldn't say my number of words per week or month has increased substantially. Um, but I also think too, I would never shut the door, I'm not asking for my job back, but I would never shut the door on going back and business especially with publishing the way it is, at some point, you know, if I get bored with writing or I see an opportunity, I could see myself either starting my own publishing consulting or, mm. you know, going to one of these big ebook places like Google Meanwhile. if they actually sell a lot of ebooks. Um, yeah, so I'm keeping those doors open. So talk about the cover art for a second. How'd you get that? You, you want to, should we show the... Yeah, the cover art was really fun. So, and no, it's not me. Uh, my brother told me that the, they put my, my family is very cute about this. When they got their first paperback copy, they stopped the UPS man and made him wait while they opened the box. 
Um, and then they gave him my bookmarks, so that was nice. But yeah, they've apparently put these bookmarks all over town and they're getting questions about whether it's me, so that's awkward. It's not me. Um, but the cover art process, there are now, because so many people are moving to self-publish, people like cover artists from the old publishing houses, or I hired a freelance editor who used to be an editor at Harlequin, they're moving to do more of their own freelance stuff because they can make more money and have more reasonable hours than they could being a cog in the wheel at a publishing house. So, photo? yeah, it's a photo. So if you go to hotdamndesigns.com, um, this woman takes all this stock photography. And so she has the costumes, she does all the, you know, stages these things. You can get not just historical, but paranormal, you know, contemporary, all of that. Um, and then she designs the covers. So I sent her, you know, this is what my characters are like. I like covers where you can't see the woman's head. I don't know why, but actually I do know why. Like it, I don't like seeing the person's face and having that visual when I want to manage, imagine, yeah. So yeah, so that was fun. Thank you for humoring me by raising your hand. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. So Claire gets a free copy. Everyone else is eleven ninety nine. I'm sorry, but I take cash or credit card. And if you are really excited about credit card, I have the little Square app, which I know is not a Google thing, but it's amazing. It plugs into the iPad, so you can just swipe it. It's pretty cool. Remarks or pieces of advice or, or plugs, you know, marketing. It's like a follow your dreams. talk shows. <laughs> and available, you know. It's available. It's available on Barnes & Noble, uh, Amazon. The next one, which I just finished last night, as I said, you're lucky I'm here, um, will be out March 29th, which is the huge advantage of doing this myself because if it were a traditional publisher, I would mail it to them. They'd respond in three months and say, great, change this stuff. It'd probably be a year to 18 months before it came out. So... Next one's out, Scotsmen prefer blondes. Amy, I'll ask you later if that's true. Okay. All right, well thank you so much and congratulations. Thanks for coming everyone.